Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I am the Social Media and Marketing Coordinator here at Lymphoma Canada. I'm pleased today to welcome our experts, Dr. Christine Chen, Dr. Michael Crump, Dr. Gwen Davies, and Dr. Ivan Lispinov to answer your questions from the breakout sessions on Waldenstrom, and please forgive my pronunciation of this, macroglobulinemia, follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. As a reminder to all of our audience members, please type your questions into the Q&A box in the middle of the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, and we're going to be asking these questions to the group of panelists. Whoever feels the most comfortable based on their specialty can unmute themselves to answer the questions. So, we already have a question that has come in. This first question is from someone who has indolent MCL. They said that they see their doctor every six months and they'd like to know, is that normal? Um, I can start. <clears throat> so you have indolent mantle cell lymphoma. Um, I would say if you're in a, in a patient that's been designated that way in my practice, um, you would have had to have had a couple of scans three to six months apart from the time of diagnosis to be sure that things are stable. Um, and if that's the case, if there's no signs that the lymphoma is progressing, then you would come back to the clinic every, usually every six months for a, for a discussion about symptoms, uh, a physical examination to check lymph nodes, uh, whether or not there's been any new lymph nodes show up or whether or not any lymph nodes might be growing. Um, examination of the abdomen to look for a big liver and spleen, things like that. Uh, and some blood tests sometimes are helpful as well, but a lot of it is driven by how you are and whether or not you have noticed any new changes in the in the months prior. Um, I would say that for many of the patients that I follow that who are not in need of treatment, a six month interval seems to work. And the final part would be, even if that seems like a long time, or maybe it's too often, I'm not sure, but if that seems like too long of a time, we definitely encourage patients to you know, call if something has happened to them, if they have something that's persistent and progressive, or their doctor, or their family doctor has done a test and they're concerned about what the results show and whether or not it reflects um, progression of lymphoma. So it's hard to be comfortable with, uh, with being watched without treatment, but um, it's certainly possible to do that. And six months seems like a reasonable interval for most people. Thank you, Dr. Crump. Um, next up, one of the questions that was asked is, how common is it for lymphoma to transform into another form of cancer? Um, so I can, I can address that question. I didn't want to hog because I see in the Q&A that there's another question uh, addressed to me. Um, so it, it varies a bit somewhat by the type of indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so because of just how many, what proportion of people have kind of follicular lymphoma versus, you know, marginal zone lymphoma or some of the other rarer um, subtypes, we have the most information from follicular lymphoma. Um, and so we do know that um, about 3% of people each year, their uh, follicular lymphoma can transform into a more aggressive type of lymphoma. Most commonly, that would be something called diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, and uh, and that you know that risk unfortunately does kind of continue over time. Um, there's some studies that suggest you know exposure to rituximab might reduce the risk of of transformation, but it's sort of a bit unclear. Um, because a lot of those are kind of looking back and trying to, to see the correlation between the two. Um, but the risk is, is pretty, um, pretty constant over time for follicular lymphoma. That risk might be a little bit uh, lower for other subtypes like uh, marginal zone lymphoma. Um, but certainly if um, we have a patient in front of us who has symptoms, for instance, that they're suddenly losing weight, having fevers or sweats, or if they had you know, a lymph node that was growing. Sometimes we can see changes in their blood work, such as um, their LDH level going up quite significantly, or 
high calcium or suddenly, you know, just, just a lot of change from what we expect, um, then we would be suspicious for it. And in that case, we would, um, we would be thinking about doing a biopsy to confirm if there's transformation or not. Thank you for that. That was very useful. And like, that was a very well thought out answer. Um, another question that was posed in the Q&A session is, um, so someone who is currently in the middle of treatment for marginal zone, why would their oncologist be testing for hep B during treatment? I guess I can answer this because it's the same answer for all the types of indolent lymphoma. Uh, we test for hepatitis B before starting treatment because the therapies will suppress your immune system. And if you've been exposed to hep B and you carry the virus, um, then there's a risk of what we call reactivation of the hepatitis. You may not have symptoms to hepatitis B. You may have acquired it as a baby. Um, from your mother, or you may have acquired it in another way um, from uh, your past and may not have any symptoms. And therefore, we wouldn't, would not be alerted to it unless we actually test in advance. Um, and uh, particularly drugs like rituximab, which are antibodies that uh, can particularly predispose to developing reactivation of hepatitis B. And if we find that you carry that virus are in at risk, then um, your doctor may choose to put you on an antiviral medication to prevent the reactivation during and after treatment. Uh, often the risk is not over at the end of chemotherapy or any therapy, but persists for months afterwards. Um, and so there's uh, uh, antiviral prophylaxis that it could be used. And of course, there would be closer monitoring of your liver tests to make sure that your, your liver doesn't flare and become inflamed with the reactivation. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, the next question we have is, what is the difference between Waldenstrom's and lymphoblastin? Oh, I can't say it. I apologize. Um, Lymphoplasmatic lymphoma. Um, so it took me a couple of years to learn how to pronounce all these as well. <laughs> Sorry, so I think uh, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, I think is what you were saying versus uh, Waldenstrom's. They really are the same disease when you look at them under a microscope. If you look at either the bone marrow or if there's an en enlarged lymph node or um, tissue that's biopsied. Uh, under the microscope, it looks like what we call lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, which means you have kind of a mix of cells that look like standard lymphocytes, um, which are a type of white blood cell. Um, other cells that are more like plasma cells, which are more mature um, B cells that make antibodies. Uh, these are all found in your immune system. Or you can have cells that kind of have a mix of features when you look at them between lymphocytes and plasma cells. Um, and then, of course, they have a, a sort of standard um, marking on their surface for um, uh, that, that mark them as B cells. And that's morphologically, or what we call just by looking at them under a microscope, that's uh, what we refer to as lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. When that um, is, is um, uh, seen alongside an elevation of an IgM protein in the blood, then we refer to that as Waldenstrom specifically. Uh, if the protein that's being made by this lymphoma is not IgM and it's something else like IgA or IgG, then we just uh, refer to it generically as lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. So it's really all the same disease. It's just distinguished by the type of protein that's made. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, what are the benefits of radioimmunotherapy, therapy? And when should this treatment option be considered for lymphoma patients?
Uh, I'll take a shot at that. Um, <clears throat> um, so radio immunotherapy is generally, there's probably something that's not really used very much in Canada for sure. Um, so that's, you probably, from its name, would understand that this is, these are antibodies that have a radioactive atom attached to them. Um, the ones that are of, that have been developed in lymphoma uh, are uh, directed, um, much like other antibodies, to CD20, and they either have radioactive iodine or something called yttrium attached to them. Um, so it's a it's a very clever way of targeting radiation to right where lymphoma might be. If if a person has a B cell lymphoma, they often almost most of them will express this protein called CD20. So this antibody will attach itself to the CD20 on the outside of the lymphoma cell and kind of delivers radiation right to the doorstep of the lymphoma, as it were. Um, so um, we were quite excited a long time ago about this, the, this development. It looked like it was very active in, um, in particular in indolent lymphomas like follicular lymphoma, uh, produced remissions where chemotherapy was no longer working. Um, and I don't know if I can give a, a very uh, erudite answer as to why it's not used very much, but they never really kind of caught on, at least in Canada. Uh, approved in Europe, approved in the US, um, but maybe for some technical reasons, they're a little bit cumbersome to deliver. Um, they never really kind of uh, took hold and other therapies kind of went on ahead of them, as it were, uh, and became a little bit easier to deliver and and really became preferred. But Maybe others on a, on this uh, panel can comment as well. So it would usually be at least when it was these therapies were developed, they were for patients who had already had experienced uh, treatments that had stopped working. So after one or two chemotherapy recipes uh, regimens, this would be the treatment that would be uh, given to them. But it, I think it's becoming less and less popular uh, as time goes on, as newer therapies have, uh, that are easier to deliver have been uh, have been developed. So I would say there's probably not really in Canada a strong role for them at all, uh, partly in that they never really took a foothold in the, in the lymphoma treatment uh, arsenal, at least uh, not in my center. And that's probably true of a lot of Canadian centers as well. But maybe others have yeah. more insightful comments. Not more insightful, just, just adding to that. Um, yeah, so I think there's a couple challenges. Um, one was that, um, one of these products was, or one of these treatments was actually off the market for a bit and then was reavail um, was became available again. Um, one of the other challenges is that this treatment has to be given in a special location in the hospital because of sort of risk to other patients or to, to family members. So um, similar to, you know, treatment for thyroid cancer where patients can be a risk to others after they get the treatment, that's also an issue whenever you're giving a radioimmunoconjugate. Um, and then lastly, I think there's some concerns, you know, every treatment that we have does, there is the potential for, you know, adverse or um, for side effects that can happen from it. Um, so there is some concern that there's a, a different type of blood cancer that can result from damage to the stem cells um, that can result from this treatment. Um, so in order to actually give the treatment, they recommend doing a bone marrow on both sides to get a really good sample to make sure there's no evidence of kind of funny looking um, cells in the bone marrow to even begin with. And also to make sure that there's an adequate percentage of normal cells in the bone marrow. So it's just a bit more kind of complex um, to deliver the treatment. And I think, you know, we're really lucky that we have sort of more access to well or better tolerated oral medications and things like that. Again, sort of weighing, you know, we don't want to over treat people where we're giving them lots of side effects, knowing that a lot of these sort of slower growing lymphomas, we can put them into remission for a long period of time with less toxic treatments. Thank you both for answering that question. Um, the next question that we have is, where across Canada are cl clinical trials being completed with biospecific antibodies? Which lymphoma subtypes is this therapy currently targeting? And how do I become involved in a cl clinical trial? Um, so uh, if unless someone else wants to answer, I can answer that as well. 
Um, so there is there's multiple um, centers where the bispecific antibodies are um, being incorporated. They're not um, sort of commercially available within Canada. So we can't, you know, they're not funded as, to my knowledge within any of the provinces. Um, so a lot of those uh, clinical trials will be happening in sort of larger centers like um, Vancouver, uh, Toronto, Calgary, um, Montreal. Um, we have a study with that open here. And then within each clinical trial, sometimes they're on their own, sometimes they're combined with other agents. So there's a lot of kind of variation that can happen with the clinical trials. There's a couple different bispecifics um, that are being uh, kind of examined. They all have super long names like mozinutuzumab or epcaritimab or glufitimab. Um, but there are a couple of them are being examined in different subtypes of lymphoma. Um, so it's just really important to communicate with your provider and to see if there's options. Um, there might not be one at a center that's close to you, but there might be available at a, a nearby center. Um, and then I just always say kind of the later stages, so phase kind of two and phase three, sometimes there's a lot of upfront um, visits for a clinical trial, but then that actually tapers off over time. So even though you might, um, that trial might not be offered at the center closest to you, um, you know, if you're really interested or motivated and you're right for this study, which would be decided in collaboration with the clinical trial investigators, it might be an option that, um, you know, you sort of, you know, make your way through the first cycle or couple cycles, and then actually the sort of requirements to be on site uh, decrease over time. So it might be a really good option. So just communicating with your, your local site is probably the best way to find out about those. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we got in the chat was, um, so I have cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and I have been told that it is categorized as a rare cancer. Does that mean that there are less treatment options available to me or to others with less prevalent types of lymphoma? Uh, that's a good question. So cutaneous lymphoma is considered a rare disease. There is about 10 cases per uh, million of this disease, but that doesn't mean that this is not important disease or that we're not working hard to treat this disease. It's actually one of the most important diseases that we have in dermatology. And so our specialty is working very hard with a dedicated hematologist. It's sort of like a microcosmos of a hematology uh, in testing new therapies. Yeah, over the last few years, there have been actually a number of targeted therapies that came on the market, you know, brentuximab, mogamolizumab. Uh, we, are, of course, are having challenges in accessing some of the older treatments like interferon, which is becoming now not available. But nevertheless, we feel that uh, we have sufficient treatment options uh, to address our patients. One uh, patient's needs. One issue that came up is immunotherapy. <clears throat> immunotherapy is revolutionizing uh, treatment for cancer by activating T cells. Unfortunately, cutaneous lymphoma is the disease of T cells. So sometimes immunotherapy has a double-edged double sword where in some cases it works and in some cases it promotes uh, the disease itself because it's stimulating the very T cells that are causing the cancer. And so many dermatologists and hematologists are now trying to optimize how the immunotherapy can be used for T cell lymphoma by, you know, playing with the system. And of course, that could be a potentially a big breakthrough in the next few years. So I would watch for that. But nevertheless, it's a very important disease, even though it's a rare disease, we have more than a sufficient number of treatments for our patients and we are more and more successful. So whereas the survival rates were two to four years before Possessory Syndrome, many of those patients now live six, 10 years and longer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that we have was addressed to Dr. Davies. Um, she mentioned that nodal marginal zone patients do less well. Um, can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I I, uh, I didn't ever want to alarm when I was giving my my talk on marginal zone lymphoma. So, um, you know, doing less well is kind of you know um, a bit challenging. There's you know when we look at studies, there's different types of marginal zone lymphoma. So we have 
kind of malt, we have what's called splenic marginal zone lymphoma and then the nodal marginal zone. So when we just look at um, on a whole, um, when we're talking about outcomes, um, you know, a lot of times we as doctors talk about five years from now, are you, you know, going to be in remission from your cancer? You know, is there, what is the chance actually that you could pass away from the cancer? So we do know that, you know, the clinical course for nodal marginal zone is a little, is more aggressive than, for instance, splenic or malt. You know, everyone's lymphoma is a bit different. So there are people who have no issue and can go for years without treatment with nodal marginal zone. So it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to do poorly. Just on average, we know that those patients struggle a bit more um, and do need um, more therapy or you know, more frequently will require um, systemic therapy, for instance, with, you know, chemotherapy and rituximab or rituximab, rather than, you know, local excision or a little bit of radiation or something that could put them into a remission long term. Um, but we do know, again, we have much more options um, at relapse than we have, you know, from the, the studies that I talked about, the still in the BRIGHT trial, we have sort of better tolerated therapy that results in more complete remissions. And Again, those patients, you know, even with just the frontline treatment, had more than a seven-year uh, window before, on average, before their disease would progress. So patients can still do really, really well and have, you know, excellent response rates to treatment. So thanks. Thank you. The next question we have is, sorry, I'm just going through the questions here. Um, okay, so this one's for Dr. Chen. Does LPL turn into WM, so um, Wolvenstrom, I'm assuming that is. Um, I'm diagnosed with LPL, but IgM has always been low. Now in remission after BR, can I expect IgM to rise? Um, so LPL is a, a generic term for, as I said, what it looks like under the microscope, and Waldenstrom's is one type of LPL that makes an IgM. If you didn't make the IgM at time of diagnosis before your chemotherapy, your BR, then you probably are not going to have a rise in the IgM later. You, you're, you've already been identified as someone who's just more like an LPL. Um, if you started off with an elevation in IgA or IgG, which are, are other types of immunoglobulins that can be associated with LPL, but not Waldenstrom's, then that protein would drop with chemo. And that is the one that would rise later as an indicator that your disease is, is coming back. So whatever was your original marker is usually the same marker you stick with later. Thank you, Dr. Chen. The next question that we have is about follicular lymphoma. So in your opinion, is it offensive to ask your doctor for a second opinion before you choose your treatment for follicular lymphoma? Um, since I give the talk on follicular lymphoma, maybe I should start. Uh, no, I don't think it is at all. Um, um, I think there, there's, a, there's all kinds of reasons why uh, I when I see patients that are coming for a second opinion, um, why that was requested, um, and sometimes it's actually just an opportunity to have a longer and a different kind of discussion, you know, with a different set of eyes about about the diagnosis and what the treatment options are. Um, so I've found that most of the time when I've seen people who've come from somewhere some, from somebody else, and perhaps this is also true when my patients go and seek second opinions from others, is they just want to reinforce their own understanding of what they're facing um, and get an understanding, of, for example, of why is it you know that everybody rushed to make my di a diagnosis of stage four cancer and now I'm not being treated. That's such an uncomfortable thing to hear. Um, it's a bit of a reality check to find out, is this what everybody really thinks? And I don't think anybody is for, I don't think any of us, I, I wouldn't be offended if my if I told somebody that they were going to have observation, that they went off and, and did a reality check with somebody else to find out, is this really the case? Um, and with regard to treatment options, I think that's also appropriate. I think there isn't a, there's a fairly standard frontline therapy for follicular lymphoma that most of us, and I'm not just talking about the people on this panel or in Canada even, but most people would agree is 
provides the optimum balance of disease control and um, minimizing either short-term or long-term side effects. Um, but sometimes that treatment doesn't fit within certain individuals in terms of um, what they perceive they're at concerned about or at risk of developing. So sometimes having a, a more fulsome conversation uh, with somebody else you know, helps cement the understanding of, of why a particular treatment would be recommended. And I also think, you know, the time when a lot of second opinions happen is when the first treatment didn't work like we'd expected it to. That's, you know, there's a lot of disappointment. And uh, again, having to understand what was what was different about my particular follicular lymphoma, the, the original therapy didn't work. I need to understand that better so that you can understand the choices that are in front of you. And those second opinions may lead to things like uh, Dr. Davies was talking about, about clinical trials of something new. So yeah, I don't think none of us have the right answer or have the only answer with regard to how something can be managed. But I, I do find that in some way that a lot of people come, when I've seen people for seconds opinions, it's really that sort of reality check. I needed to think about this more. I need to understand it better. I needed a little bit more time to have my questions answered that I wasn't, you know, I didn't have time to, to answer the first time around or I had, that I've thought of since that mean a lot to me. So none of us are offended if, if we, our patients want to go and talk to somebody else because I think it's usually a better understanding of what, what's ahead comes from those conversations. Sorry for the long answer. No, thank you for that. It was very informative. Um, so this is just our last question of the evening. Do treatment options in Canada for follicular lymphoma limit, um, mimic those available in other countries like the US or Europe? And I guess we can make this a more broad question for everyone to kind of answer. Um, and so do the treatment options here mimic those in other countries like the US or Europe? And if not, should I consider traveling and paying for the treatment out of pocket? That's a big question. So I guess the first part, um, so there there is differences in funding. So again, within Canada, um, our chemotherapy treatment is sort of funded on a provincial basis. So even sometimes there's differences between, you know, provinces as far as what is funded. And each, you know, provincial governing body, um, you know, looks at kind of the evidence for treatment and makes a decision about whether they're going to, um, pay for that, I've become the host, anyway, um, whether they're gonna pay for that, that therapy and what the evidence for it is. Um, it's a little bit different in the US because essentially anything that's FDA approved, if people have specific types of insurance, then they actually can access that. The There's not really sort of a state body because of the way that insurance coverage uh, occurs in the US. So there might be some slight differences that might be more apparent kind of in later lines. Again, as Dr. Crump mentioned, it's pretty standardized what we're giving first line for follicular lymphoma, and that would be kind of in North America, Europe, Australia, anything like that. Um, we do know that some relapse therapies, again, we have differential access um, for those, so we don't quite have the same access. And so again, a clinical trial um, can be a good option. Um, as far as traveling, again, that's a very personal decision. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these therapies that we have now, you know, with antibodies and drug conjugates and bispecifics and CAR-T, a lot of those therapies are, are very costly. So some people, um, you know, do speak to a physician in a different country and, um, you know, when they're given the information, they'll elect to go and pursue that. But again, I think that's like a really personal decision they have to make sort of understanding what's being offered to them and what the associated costs are. Um, there are some studies that cover costs associated with trials and with travel, um, but that's usually for kind of rarer subtypes where they're having, you know, they have to work harder to recruit patients. So um, for more common subtypes where there's a lot of local patients that they can recruit, a lot of those patient support programs don't, um, don't cover everything. Hi everyone, sorry, Rebecca's laptop died. Um, so it is 6.30, so we are going to conclude and go to the final remarks. Um, thank you everyone for participating in the Q&A session.